Let's start out with the serenity prayer again. God, 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 God grant me serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Uh, welcome. And, uh, thank you. Another beautiful day. Before things move along, I have a feeling that people will start drifting out at various times during the morning. And before that happens, I want to thank everybody for being here and tell you that I've had a wonderful time. And uh, it's really a pleasure. And uh, it does appear that we're going to be doing this again next year. So I wanted to talk today about uh, the 12th step um, and also a bit, uh, bit more about uh, uh, right concentration, but mostly, mostly about the 12th step. And uh, I, to start off with, I have a misquote here. Um, and I, I credited the Dalai Lama was saying, uh, Dalai Lama was saying that my religion is love and compassion, and I stumbled across what I actually have written down somewhere, and he says that my religion is kindness. Mm -hmm. Kindness. Mm -hmm. so it, it's uh, very succinct, and I think it's very important. Uh, so I, I needed to correct that, but the intent was uh, about the same. I'm going to start today with uh, something out of the 12 and 12. Um, and it's, it's in the, the, the 12th step, and they're talking about uh, what alcoholics are like. And it, the paragraph starts, uh, When AA was quite young, a number of eminent psychologists and doctors made an exhaustive study of a good-sized group of so-called problem drinkers. The doctors weren't trying to find out how different we were from one another. They sought to uh, find whatever personality traits, if any, this group of alcoholics had in common. They finally came up with a conclusion that shocked the A members of the time. These distinguished men had the nerve to say that most of the alcoholics under investigation were childish, emotionally sensitive, and grandiose. And they read this on Friday night. Um, but I think that that is helpful for me. Is like, okay, there's a starting point. And now it would be a good idea uh, for me to try and shift out of that place and to uh, get to know myself better uh, and to, to uh, in one way put it, grow up. But in the, in the terminology that we're, we're using here is to develop what would be called the right view, uh, come to know what uh, my intentions are, uh, become more skillful with my effort and my concentration, and uh, try to do the same things with my speech and with my actions and how I spend my, my time for, for my livelihood. And so that's what we're doing. For me, we're trying to shift out of being childish, emotionally sensitive, and grandiose, and do it in a, a more skillful way using the Buddhist teachings than I would likely do without the Buddhist teachings. And so that's, that's sort of the uh, uh, where I'm starting. There's another uh, line down here. We have seen that we were prodded by unreasonable fears or anxieties into making a life business of winning fame, money, and what we thought was leadership. And then a little farther on, and at heart, we had all been abnormally fearful. And I really, that really, really speaks to me. And the irony for me of that is that I really had no idea that I had that uh, level of fear, that type of fear. And I think that quite often, if you had met me uh, in the work world, uh, there's no way you would have known that that was going on for me. And, uh, and at times today, that still can be the case. But it's really improved uh, a great deal. Um, now going back uh, to the beginning of the chapter, The joy of living is the theme of AA's 12th step, and action is its key word. Here we turn outward toward our fellow alcoholics who are still in distress. Here we experience the kind of giving that asks no rewards. Here we begin to practice all 12 steps of the program in our daily lives so we and those about us may find emotional sobriety. When the 12th step is seen in its full implication, it is really talking about the kind of love that has no price tag on it. We have each found something called a spiritual awakening. 
and then a little further still, when a man or a woman has a spiritual awakening, the most important meaning of it is that he is, has now become able to do, feel, and believe that which he could not do before on his unaided strength and resources alone. He has been granted a gift which amounts to a new state of consciousness and being. He has been set on a path which tells him he is really going somewhere, that life is not a dead end, not something to be endured or mastered. In a very real sense, he has been transformed because he has laid hold of a source of strength which in one way or another he had hitherto denied himself. He finds himself in possession of a degree of honesty, tolerance, unselfishness, peace of mind, and love of which he had thought himself quite incapable. What he has received is a free gift, and yet usually, at least in some small part, he has made himself ready to receive it. Um, you know, really, I don't think there's too many more readings that could be more Buddhist than, than, than that. Uh, and so the, the work is, is, this is the 12th step of you know, having had a, a, a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. So the implication is that we've got, we've got to do work. The same thing as we're looking at the Eightfold Path is there's work to be done, is to be done on a, a sort of basically a continuous basis. And in my view, uh, it really isn't to be a burden. And if I'm doing it and feeling as though it is a burden, if I'm a victim and I have to do this to get okay, then I'm going to remain a victim. But if I can go, ah, you know, I get to do this today rather than I have to do this today, it shifts the whole uh, energy of the, the karma for me and uh, it frees me up. So what I'd like to do is to have you all break up into groups of four. Bobby looks pleased with this. Uh, and have a talk about uh, the spiritually awake people that you have seen or the uh, shift in your own spiritual relationship with yourself since you've started to get into recovery. And if you're not feeling particularly spiritual or highly evolved, <laughs> tell your group, I, this stinks. <laughs> or I hate this. It's okay. <laughs> it's not a problem. Uh, if you can, split into, uh, you know, connect with people who you haven't been in a group with before to, you know, at least get a couple people in there you don't know. And uh, we'll take 15 minutes to talk about the spiritual awakenings you have experienced, that you have seen, that you would like to have, or possibly that you don't believe is possible. Okay? Okay, we're going to, um, I just got a couple more uh, minutes of uh, a couple more things I'd like to read to you. And then I'd suggest, uh, I, I wanted to do a, a meditation, and I would once again suggest that you know, as many as you want to do a walking meditation because it's gorgeous out. And uh, uh, would anybody like to do that? You'd like to do walking? Okay. There's, there's some good. Okay, so we'll do that. Yes? Oh, I've just I've never done walking meditation. Can you just explain that? I I can explain it to the best of my ability. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, correctly, um, like if you're doing a vipassana or samadhi meditation, they generally call it sitting meditation. But correctly, it can be done in any of four postures: lying <laughs> down, sitting, standing, or walking. So. It, really is the same meditation as you would be doing sitting in a chair except for you're standing and moving. Uh, the idea is, is that you uh, are focusing your awareness, your attention, on uh, the ambulatory aspects of moving uh, slowly. Uh, the teachers uh, in, in, in retreats will often uh, focus very particularly on the lifting and placing of, e of each foot, each step. Uh, it can look a little weird. Actually, there's there's a great story that uh, uh, that I've heard a couple of times. So there's this uh, monk named Ajahn Chah who was a teacher of Jack Cornfields and Joseph Goldstein's, and uh, he came to the U.S. to the Insight Meditation Society where. Uh, they do a lot of sitting meditation, walking meditation, and uh, he was observing all of these very earnest students uh, walking inside and outside the place, and he thought that they looked like they were in a mental institution. <laughs> and so he was one of these guys from Thailand, uh, Burma, and he's walking along going, 
get better soon. I hope you get better. <laughs> and I, t I told that story to Anali that uh, I was at a, a retreat with him uh, earlier this year, and I told that story. And he, this, he's a Buddhist monk from Sri Lanka, and uh, and he just cracked up. He almost fell off his platform. And, and he called me back and told me a story about this monk that had gone to a major monastery in Thailand and they, they had like 500 uh, uh, retreatants who were uh, doing walking meditation and they all looked very earnest and you know very studied and very serious they all wanted to hit enlightenment you know in the next two weeks and except for one person he saw this one woman and she was smiling so he went up to this one woman and she he said excuse me but I notice you're smiling she says oh I'm so sorry I'm a visitor <laughs> In my view, and in this, this uh, gentleman Analio's view and Ajahn Chah's view, is the purpose of all this is not to be so damn serious. Mm -hmm. it's, we are not going to hit enlightenment this week, or this weekend, or next week. What the idea is, is to be aware, to let uh, everything in that uh, is in fact happening, that we generally filter out. So notice the smells, notice the birds, notice the feeling of the sun on your skin. Notice when it becomes uncomfortable, notice when it becomes comfortable. Notice when your parents show up in your brain and cause you all sorts of difficulty. Notice when the kids show up. Notice, and just notice, and then bring yourself back to your steps. Um, and and I, I mentioned yesterday, uh, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, when he does walking meditation, he says, flow like a river. Uh, he's not as focused on this particular focus on raising one foot and setting down the heel and setting down the toe and raising the other foot. He's more into the flow and the noticing uh, the world around you. So that, and that, that's all it is. Okay. okay? Thank you. And so before we go on that, I want to read uh, a couple of things. Um, and this, the first one I'm reading is just because I stumbled across it and uh, uh, it could be relevant. Walking meditation when angry. When anger arises, we may wish to go outside to practice walking meditation. The fresh air, the green trees, and the plants will help us greatly. We can practice like this. Breathing in, I know that anger is here. Breathing out, I know that anger is me. Breathing in, I know that anger is unpleasant. Breathing out, I know this feeling will pass. Breathing in, I am calm. Breathing out, I am strong enough to take care of this anger. And then the topic of the morning uh, is meditation on compassion. Love is a mind that brings peace, joy, and happiness to another person. Compassion is a mind that removes the suffering that is present in the other. We all have the seeds of love and compassion in our minds, and we can develop these fine and wonderful sources of energy. We can nurture the unconditional love that does not expect anything in return, and therefore does not lead to anxiety and sorrow. The essence of love and compassion is understanding. The ability to recognize the physical, material, and psychological suffering of others to put ourselves inside the skin of the other. We go inside their body, feelings, and mental formations and witness for ourselves their suffering. Shallow observation as an outsider is not enough to see their suffering. We must become one with the object of our observation. When we are in contact with another's suffering, a feeling of compassion is born in us. Compassion means literally to suffer with. We begin by choosing as the object of our meditation someone who is undergoing physical or material suffering, someone who is weak and easily ill, poor or oppressed, or has no protection. This kind of suffering is easy for us to see. After that, we can practice being in contact with more subtle forms of suffering. Sometimes the other person does not seem to be suffering at all but we may notice that he has sorrows which have left their marks in hidden ways. People with more than enough material comforts also suffer. We look deeply at the person who is the object of our meditation on compassion, both during sitting meditation and when we are actually in contact with him. 
we must allow enough time to be really in deep <coughs> contact with his suffering. We continue to observe him until compassion arises and penetrates our being. When we observe deeply in this way, the fruit of our meditation will naturally, reform, naturally transform into some kind of action. We will not just say, I love him very much, but instead, I will do something so that he will suffer less. The mind of compassion is truly present when it is effective in removing another person's suffering. We have to find ways to nourish and express our compassion. <coughs> When we come into contact with another person, our thoughts and actions should express our mind of compassion, even if that person says and does things that are not easy to accept. We practice in this way until we see clearly that our love is not contingent upon the other person being lovable. Then we can know that our mind of compassion is firm and authentic. We ourselves will be more at ease person who has been the object of our meditation will also benefit eventually. His suffering will slowly diminish, and his life will gradually be brighter and more joyful as a result of our compassion. We can also meditate on the suffering of those who cause us to suffer. Anyone who has made us suffer is undoubtedly suffering too. We only need to follow our breathing and look deeply and naturally we will see his suffering. A part of his difficulties and sorrows may have been brought about by his parents' lack of skill when he was still young. But his parents themselves may have been victims of their parents. The suffering has been transmitted from generation to generation and been reborn in him. If we see that, we will no longer blame him for making us suffer because we know that he is also a victim. To look deeply is to understand. Once we understand the reasons he has acted badly, our bitterness towards him will vanish and we will long for him to suffer less. We will feel cool and light, and we can smile. We do not need the other person to be present in order to bring about reconciliation. When we look deeply, we become reconciled with ourselves, and for us, the problem no longer exists. Sooner or later, he will see our attitude and will share in the freshness of the stream of love which is flowing naturally from our heart. Um, the book? Peace is Every Step. Yeah. Peace is Every Step, Thich Nhat Hanh. Oh, yeah, Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, so let's do a walking meditation. Anybody that would like to stay and sit and meditate, feel free to stay and sit and meditate. And I'll come out and ring the bell in about uh, 20 minutes.